welcome to the Grace Hour Show, a Christian program that takes a dive into our daily challenges and helps us learn our faith in a practical way. My name is Liz Robbins. I'm joined by my husband, Roger Robbins, today in the studio. Who is highly caffeinated. <laughs> and today, uh, we're going to be introducing this week's topic to you. It's a, it's a beautiful one. I think it's going to be really great. We're going to be talking about um, the different areas and ways that God does his deep work in our life. And today, um, we've titled our episode, God's Deep Work Alone in the Wilderness. And we want to talk about those, what, you know, what we would term like wilderness times or experiences, seasons in our lives where we are alone. We're in a time of isolation Mm -hmm. and um, they can be very, very difficult. Our faith can be challenged in like very intense and real ways. And um, yeah, I mean, kind of before we we get into that specific um, area of of isolation or times of, of loneliness, I just think it's really important for us to, as believers, recognize that um, God does his most deep work in times of difficulty, in, in what we would call trials, in times of suffering, and, and certainly in times when, of isolation and hardship. We know that. We see it throughout the Bible. But as believers, I think we can, we can be unprepared <laughs> For Mm -hmm. when those times come and when they do, we can easily fall prey to the devil's accusation when he, he asks this, he could ask this question with, and you can hear that mocking voice that would say, where is your God now? Like now that you're in this situation that you never planned for, you never asked for, you don't want it. Mm. It's really hard. You can't get out of it. Where is your God now? Mm. And, you know, we talk about the mountaintop experiences of life where you're living in victory, there's joy, there's prosperity. But then when things are are hard and dark and lonely and not clear and uncertain, where is your God now is the question that the devil will 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 shoot at you. Mm-hmm. And if we don't have this in our hearts and we're not convinced that like God does deep work in these times, mm. these valley times, these dark times, then we will be prone to to that doubt and that insecurity that the devil yes. wants us to have. Yes. So I just thought it was important to just before and, and as the week continues and we're going to be talking about different times and ways mm-hmm. uh, and difficult things that God uses to do that deep work that that's like uh, such an important part of growing in our trust in God is that even in these times there's work that's being done and Mm. we can trust, we can kind of in a sense rest in that truth. Yeah. And that's what we want to say to the audience and all of us today, spur us on to know that second Chronicles six, one Solomon said that the Lord said he lives in thick darkness. Mm. Like, God is not excluded from the darkness of your life. He's not excluded. He's not not there in the wilderness. And, you know, as you were saying, like, can we or we must uh, trust God in this experience? I think the question when when we look at the wilderness and the deep work that's evident, right? Like, No one, it's inevitable. No one's unscathed. Like everyone gets affected by disappointment and hurt, Mm. anger, dark moments. The, uh, the, the appearance of it all Mm -hmm. is, is even just tragic. And it really, whether it is a scar, whether it is a pain undone, like unjust or just, um, right. Deserved or undeserved. Yeah. So. So the question is, is like, as you view it, who it, I look at it two ways. Do you see a teacher or do you see a tempter? Hmm. Like you were saying like, That's well, good. you got the devil on one hand going like, you won't surely die. <clears throat> like what God said is not true. Contrary. Yeah. He's going contrary to the word of God. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was thinking just, uh, Isaiah 37, um, sent a cherub surrounds Judah Right, he invades it, and um, Hezekiah receives a letter from the hand of the messengers in verse fourteen, and he read it. And uh, Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, and 
And that was his mode of operation. And you read the chapter and he just, he exalts the Lord and he just makes him like, you're just going to be the driver of this, you know, mm-hmm. Jesus take the wheel moment, right? Like I'm going to, I'm going to allow the deep work in me. I'm going to yield. And those are two words we want to use today, right, Liz? We're going to like, there's two versions that play out in the deep work. Um, not versions, but one uh, outcomes and modes in which we operate. Uh, the first we want to categorize as yielding. When a wilderness happens, one option, one alternative uh, is to yield. So we're going to talk about that. Mm-hmm. And then the other alternative is to rage. Yeah. Like to get angry, yeah. to kick against, go against this, the, what, what God is doing. So, and there's, there's a lot of scripture to kind of go through it, Mm. but before we get there, I was thinking about the wildernesses and isn't it so true that I've, I recently defined it, uh, in a message once that, um, we could say a wilderness is of two categories. One is like a known wilderness, Mm -hmm. like in the book of Ruth, Ruth is drawn into a wilderness because of a famine and because her uh, husband was taken away, right? And and you see in chapter one, the the reality of what was happening. It was very tangible. It was very known. It Mm -hmm. was factual, historical, and they were a part of it. And there was no, there was no uh, way for them to get out of it. They just embraced it. It was known, right? The second one is the unknown um, wilderness. And one of the ways we could look at that is Job 36. Really, really great chapter when it comes to the deep work of God. And I want to just read a couple verses. And I think I've read these verses before, but they, they're they so good. And it's Elihu, the, young, the younger teaching or kind of like uh, exhorting Job. Mm-hmm. And helping him understand his his three friends are not giving good counsel, right, in this wilderness. But Elihu gives good counsel. And in chapter 36, he says in verse 15, he delivers the afflicted by their affliction. And he opens their ear by adversity. Mm -hmm. Hmm. He also allured you out of distress into a broad place where there was no cramping and what was set on your table was full of fatness. You read the chapter and he's talking about God's greatness. And it's like, you have a friend telling you about something that is completely not known to you. Like Job doesn't clearly understand he's just, he's righteous. Yeah, Why this happened? Why? This is completely unknown to me. Yeah. So you had the known and then you have the unknown. Yeah. And, but yet the one singular thing here is that God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases, <laughs> right? Yeah. Psalm 115, uh, verse three, right? And, and we, he, and he wants to know, he wants us to know that it's him doing his thing. Mm. You know, it's he's on the throne. Yeah. And, and so in some ways, as we see in the known category, We see Ruth and Naomi working it out. I think that's very relatable to our lives and how God gives us those people and those situations that are very difficult in the deep work Mm. as we navigate through it. And then also in the unknown, like Luke 22, Jesus is like, I prayed for you, Peter, that you're, that you won't, you won't be taken away. I prayed for you. You're not going to know. You're not going to know exactly why, why you denied me three times, you Mm -hmm. know, and why you, this, that, and the other. I think that's really important because, uh, as people, we, we, we love to ask why. I I mean, I think it's built into us that we want to understand why things happen. And when you think about God, for whatever reason, bringing us to a place of isolation, um, we want to understand why. And I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing, but if we're so focused on the why that we miss out on like 
that teaching aspect, like what is the work he's doing yeah. because we're busy with the why. Right. Um, and you think about Job, I think that's a great example. Like he's trying, he's trying to understand why and, and his friends are also like, mm. they're trying to give him they're taking some, a stab at it. Yeah. They're taking a stab at like, why this happened to you? Cause this is really oh, obviously <laughs> horrible. So here's what I think is why, but the better question is like, what is there to be learned? And and that's the beautiful like conclusion well, of Job. And doesn't that go back to what I'm saying here is like, do you have a teacher or a tempter in your wilderness? Yeah. Cause really like there's two ways of going about this. Mm. Um, there's, there's counsel and there's something to be understood, mm. but do we have as believers, like we, we are, we are being exhorted to know the scripture, to know and understand that God is, is present, right? We cannot deny that he is, he is everywhere present. Yeah. Right. But if we exclude that, and let's say like we exclude faith, we, Mm. we, we don't use that as a way in which to see and perceive, then the tempter is around the corner. Yeah. And he has another version. He's got another narrative to give us, right? He's got a fiction to spin mm. that this wilderness is this, that, and the other thing. God isn't like that. You know, God isn't so good. You know, like, yeah. where is your God now? Like you said, yeah. right? Like, well, and I was thinking about like, okay, if, if you find yourself in a place where you're, you're really uh, in this isolated, like feeling maybe abandoned and alone. If you look in the Bible, there's different, different accounts where sometimes the reason for that isolation is that person's own choices have led them Mm -hmm. there. And other times it's, it's the actions of others, right. That have, have led you to this place. And, and then sometimes there's not even like, we don't know why it's Mm -hmm. not, it's not even that clear, but in all of them, we see that God works and that's yeah. like, that is the bottom line. Yes. You could seek to understand, like I was thinking about Jonah, right? Jonah is a prophet and God tells him to go and, and preach to the Ninevites, tell them to repent of all their disgusting, wicked, sinful ways. Mm-hmm. And Jonah's like, no, not doing it. And he goes the opposite direction. He gets kicked off the boat finally and gets swallowed by a whale. And he sits there and he's alone <laughs> And thinking probably he's going to die. And, and it's in that that he says, finally, like, concludes that, okay, salvation belongs to the Lord. And he gets spit out. Mm-hmm. And so there's an example of, of a time of isolation, of being literally dumped overboard and mm-hmm. abandoned. And it was his own doing. Yeah, It was a direct disobedience of, to God. And what do we conclude? That's not really the important lesson. Mm-hmm. The lesson isn't... Don't disobey God. It's that like God desired for him to understand his heart. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, later in the chapter where it says that, you know, that Jonah was so displeased when the Ninevites repented because he said that, you know, I knew that you were slow to anger, a gracious God, merciful, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Yeah. And so even after getting (laughs) spit out by the whale, Mm -hmm. he was still not accepting that like, this is who you are, God, and I should be thankful that well, you don't judge the Ninevites. When we right? look at the wilderness, it's uninhabited land, desert, uh, wasteland, right? <clears throat> and really, uh, we got two modes of operation when it happens, when the deep work happens, right? We run towards the light, we run away from the light, right? Like yeah. we are uncomfortable, right? Like when something happens... Uh, we are uncomfortable. Um, we're uncomfortable with silence, right? Like how, how, how fitting is that today? Like, can anyone have silence? You know, I was recently with a, a guy in my, uh, my, at my workplace and he was like, just, can you just play some music? I was like, I kind of like the silence. Like, can you just be quiet? (laughs) He's Uh, like, you weirdo. (laughs) Yeah. Like, uh, darkness or stillness, like is all darkness bad? You know, like, could it be that we embrace the darkness for a minute? I don't mean like in some weird, like, fictional way. I mean it in like God is... An opportunity to still yourself. And and to acknowledge that God is there. Like, we give too much credit to the tempter Mm. being there. 
yeah. in the wilderness. We're oh. like, oh, he's just everywhere in the wilderness. Right. It's never anywhere I want to be. Yeah. But like, why don't we give God the credit and, and give him the honor he deserves that he, he he's abides and lives in thick darkness. He's not just mm. in the temple. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like he's there. I recently was with someone who shared um, some traumatic experiences of their life. And you know what they said to me? Years later, God revealed to them that in that horribly dark time, he said that I realized God was there. He was like with me. Mm. He was holding me. Wow. He was keep protecting me. Even when the thing, different things had happened tragically in their lives, God was there. And I thought I was like, I, I walked away and thought to myself, like, God, you, you, you're, you're okay with the darkness and, and how you want to, like it says, um, Psalm 1828, God lightened my darkness. Mm. Like God is looking to bring light in to the darkness. Mm. And, and that is his mode. That is the way in which he wants us to understand him. Mm. And what better way to do it? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, should we just like be in the brightest place ever and then just pour on more light? I mean, how can that make sense if we are to understand and know God, God shouldn't, shouldn't we be brought into the darkness, so to speak? Yeah. And shouldn't we taste the suffering and Mm. the, um, and God wants us to know him in a deeper way. Yes, because I I love that it, it, the light is like it's a clarity, right? Because another example I was thinking of different from Jonah um, is when um, Hagar was forced to go into the wilderness with her baby. So she was, it was the choices of yeah. other people that, that forced her to now be in this horrible situation where she's without water and she's she's ready to to just die in sorrow and this is this incredible opportunity where it says um and this is uh, Genesis 16 verse 7 it says that the angel of the lord found hagar in the wilderness wow and and after speaking to her and comforting her and and directing her verse 13 she says you are the god of seeing like you are the one who looks after me mm. And what a gift to Hagar this moment was. And it was this clarifying moment that when you remove all other possibilities of provision, there's, there's nothing that can be provided for you outside of God himself finding you in the wilderness. She, she was able to carry that through her whole life. Like, what a purifying, like clarifying moment in her life that now she knows that God sees me. Yes. He sees me and he provides for me when nobody else wanted to, nobody else could, and I couldn't for myself. Yes. So that's the light, Isn't, right? That, and, that if yeah. she wasn't in that place, she wouldn't have that. And mm-hmm. we wouldn't have this name for God, the one who sees mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. Like it's such a opportunity that when we look at the wilderness and the the darkness as an opportunity to to know God in a way that we wouldn't know him in any other way. Right. It says in Psalm 53, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And then in verse two, it says, but God looks down from heaven on the children of men to see if there is anyone who understand and Mm. who seeks after God, you know? And we, we, we must um, embrace that God is, is looking down from heaven yeah. and he is, he is there in that wilderness. Mm. He is very much present. He makes up that wilderness. Mm. You know what I mean? Like he, he is nothing like the tempter. He is a teacher in this wilderness oh. and he is looking to express all that, all that God is, all his attributes, all his all his knowledge, like he is looking to pour out um, a personal revelation and and to manifest himself to each person. Yeah. So undoubtedly, he cares. And if if we don't acknowledge that in the wilderness, like the wilderness is a completely, it's a completely different story, right? Yeah. Like, isn't it? It's it's 
unlike the teacher, because it says in Job 36 in that same chapter, behold, Elihu says, behold, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Mm. Who has prescribed for him his way? And who can say you have done wrong? Like who can say God's done wrong? Yeah. <laughs> can anyone, has anyone in history said, God, I got you. You did and something wrong. And was actually wrong. right about it. Right? <laughs> a lot of people no. have said it. No. Yeah. Right? It, yeah. Emphatically. Yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. No. And I think we, as as believers and followers of Christ, like we are able to claim these truths that are not always evident, but we can claim them. When Jesus said in Matthew 28, I am with you always. Mm. Yes. That nothing can separate us from the love of God in Romans 8. These are truths that we have to have written on our hearts so that when these times of isolation come, these times of um, being alone, maybe feeling abandoned, that these truths like speak to us. Like you said, they counsel us because um, there's that proverb that says that the fool uh, you know, when his own folly brings him to ruin, he mm-hmm. rages against God. As you yes. were saying, we have the Proverbs option 19. that we can either yield, we can yield to God, or mm. we can rage against God. And well, I think we all know exactly what that means, yeah. right? To yes. to when you find yourself in a in a place, you can right away just point the finger at God, be angry with Him. Um, especially when the why is not easily answered, Mm -hmm. you know, why is this happening? And when that doesn't have a nice, clear answer, yeah, that's when we really struggle. Right. And that's our, that I think we can put a little blame on the, the culture, right? Like, cause Mm -hmm. our whys are usually answered with a Google search and with a quick, (laughs) like call or text or just some way of finding information in which feeds that, that, desire to want to know and be mm. satisfied. Mm-hmm. But in God's wilderness, it is not so. He's right? like, well, you should want to know me more yeah. than know why you're going to have happening. to put your why on the shelf yeah. and like g- come after me. And yeah. actually, uh, Pete, uh, pastor Brian said Psalm 42, yeah. um, the enemy, it says my tears in verse three of Psalm 42 have been my food day and night while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? And then, and then verse four, the key, it says, these things I remember, I remember Mm. as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the process to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Like what self-talk is that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's what David is, is like such a gift to us is he, he was the first example of positive, positive self-talk mm-hmm. long before psychology came around that when we are in a place that our, our tears are our food, like mm-hmm. that is like, this is very real pain and sorrow that he's describing that you're able to counsel yourself with the truths of God. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it doesn't automatically remove you from that situation, right. but it provides like a framework and a value to our suffering. Cause mm. I think that is the beautiful thing is with life with God is that our suffering is not wasted. What a, that's the real, the real tragedy is if a person would be brought to this wilderness place, this yes. difficult time and not come out with a deeper understanding of God. Wow. That's like the real, that's the tragedy. If that were to happen in my life, like God forbid that he'd bring me to a place and yes, there would be suffering, but there wouldn't be a redemption. There yes. wouldn't be a, a, well, a, a reward in it. So as we speak to ourselves, first and foremost, like we're saying that the uncomfortable nature of silence and darkness and stillness, as we process disappointment and anger, mm. the dark moments that appear, we must change our, our uncomfortable um, view of things and really change that to embrace it. Like to not say, I wouldn't say like we must be comfortable, but it's almost like a surrendering or a, a uh, letting go of mm. in the wilderness, so to speak, 
to what God wants to do. And that's the first point we brought up about mm. where there's uh, two ways to go about this. The first is to yield. Yeah. And one thing that it was actually brought up in our, our church in Baltimore here Sunday morning, the pastor Schaller uh, brought it up in the 11 a.m. service. It, when we look at Genesis 4 mm. and we see how Abel sacrifice. Abel's sacrifice was accepted and then Cain's was not. And, um, and the Lord talks to Cain about this. And it's amazing because really like this is the beginning of his wilderness. Like imagine God rejecting your sacrifice. Yeah. What disappointment. Like, yeah. And you creator. worked hard. It was it was the fruit of his yeah. his labor, right? Yeah. Right? Like think about that in your life today with your boss, your your a family member, a friend, you know, yeah, like your work is not appreciated. It's, it's not it's, it's not, not accepted. accepted, right? It's not noticed. And and then then comes the counselor, God, right? And and he's he's remember like he's engaged. He's in he's gonna be in this wilderness, and we see that throughout the whole chapter of Genesis mm. four, yeah, he right? He never leaves Cain. And, but here's the sad part. And I think that's what we want to like highlight here as we talk about yielding yeah. is that the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? And then he goes on to say, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door and his desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. God gave him great counsel. At the beginning of this kind of disappointment and mm-hmm. uh, this moment of anger, this moment of anger. But here's the key point I want to make when it comes to do with yielding in our wilderness mm-hmm. is why don't we talk back to God? Because mm. when you see the next verse, what does verse eight say? If you look at the dialogue and you look at the like yeah. the the progression in the story, God speaks to Cain, right? But then in verse eight, it says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother, Abel, and killed him. God wanted to talk to Cain in the wilderness. He he was like, I'm going to have to give you the the real honest truth here. Mm. Your your sacrifice is not accepted. But that's, that's, it's not over. You might have been corrected. You might have been hurt might have been disappointed, talk back to God, yield to him, yeah. right? And isn't it so sad? Like when we see this story, he should have talked to God. Mm. Like God was listening, right? He is the great listener. You know, mm. he is waiting to be gracious, like it says in Isaiah 30, right? So this is a moment, and I think we can learn a lot from this, that we should yield in <coughs> in the wilderness, right? Yeah. I was thinking about Daniel chapter six, when, when the Lord allowed this tragic thing to happen. And it was so unjust that Daniel would be thrown into a lion's den. Hmm. But even the king believed that he would be, he would be saved. Hmm. And that night, like thinking about what kind of conversation Daniel had with the angel, da- Daniel was looking for it. Like, can you imagine? Like he he knew he was praying yeah. three times a day, mm-hmm. and when it was his time to come, he was ready to yield yeah. to whatever God was gonna do. Like, imagine that conversation that happened yeah. in that dark den. Well, we recently had a conversation with a friend who was saying that people don't see what they're not looking for, mm. um, and I think that 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 just reminded me of that right now. When you think about it, like how many times. When we are in these times when we are alone and isolated, there's darkness, there's there's wilderness experience. Are we looking are we looking for God in it? Or are we because if you're not looking for him, you're not gonna see him. And I think that this yielding, uh, it's not necessarily like conquering the the problem, getting yourself out of the wilderness. It's acknowledging that God is with you there. Like he genuinely is with you there. And that he's looking down. And he he is Could he speak to me? Could he have something to say to me? Like, Mm -hmm. is it possible even in this, even in a place I've never wanted to be, maybe I, it's from my own bad choices or it's from somebody else's or 
who knows why it doesn't even make sense. Mm. But in that, could I say like, is there something that God would want to say to me? And you can't ask that question if you don't first acknowledge that God is there with you. Mm -hmm. Like there's nobody else there, but he is there with you. Yes. And I love what you were saying. Like we're always quick to acknowledge the devil's accusations in those times. Like, oh, he's coming for me. But let's be even quicker to recognize God's presence there. Like as Mm. believers, it says we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe just to define yielding and help us understand it a little more. Let's give some like couple points to like, just quickly, like what would help us in our yielding? Um, we, I think self-talk is really a good one, right? Like what I put in affects the heart, right? Well, for sure. Like yeah. what I receive, what I take in affects the heart. Well, and I think another one is that answering of the why and, and not needing, like if you, like you said, if you could put the why on the shelf, I think that is, that can be helpful only because we can get stuck asking why this is happening to Mm -hmm. me and we don't want to move past it until we have that answer when really you will probably get the answer to why later. Yes. The, 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 why, the, why this happened. I, I know things in my life that when they were happening, it's like, why is this happening? I have no idea. And now I look back and I go, wow, like this, this had some, fruit in my life and I can now see it. Yeah. I'm the clay and he's the potter. Like uh, Job 33, 12, it says God is greater than man. Like just acknowledging the fact that I'm the finite one in this picture. I think it helps put the why on the shelf. It's like, God, you're, you're doing something and I'm just going to have to surrender and yield. Another one is like our counselors. Like, you know, what are our counselors? Um, in Jeremiah, I forgot what chapter it is. No, it's in Hosea. Is it? It's in Hosea that they took wood from the forest and, um, they hewed it into statues and they asked those statues to speak to them. Mm. Like, what are the things that we take that we ask to speak to us, to Mm. comfort us, right? Like in Psalm 78, it says, um, can God provide a table for you in the wilderness? I think it's verse 18 or 19, right? Like Mm. who's saying that versus someone who says, I can provide a table in the wilderness. Like the beginning of Job chapter one, it says that the wind of God came out of the wilderness, and also in um Song of Solomon mm-hmm. when so- when when the picture of uh the the um the one who is going to marry the beloved to visit um the beloved it says that like uh Solomon appeared out of the desert mm-hmm. like good things come out of the desert you know and it's a matter of like hearing yeah. from those right sources, those right people. Yes. And I think the Bible is just huge. full of it. Right. So how about another one is just like the body. Like when I'm in my wilderness, is it, has anyone else been in this wilderness? Mm. More likely than not, you're going to find someone who's yeah. been in a wilderness. And I was thinking like, God forbid, I don't share about our wilderness experience. Right. I'm having a trouble yielding to my, this time. Yeah. But as soon as I share it with someone, I recently had someone share something with me and I was like, dude, why didn't you tell me sooner? Yeah. I would have called you. Yeah. I would have like picked you up. Like, why didn't you tell me this happened? Well, and I, I wasn't think it's like a condemning street, them, right? Yeah. But it was like, like, it was like, why didn't you just share this? You know, cause when one suffers, we are all suffering. Well, I would, I would say in, in re- response to that also, it's important for those of us who have been through wildernesses, like you're saying that if we don't talk about them, then people won't know to call us. Mm. They won't know that this well, person can you handle say it's this. Vogue to like talk about the wilderness experiences with people. I mean, I, I mean, should it be encouraged? Like, like I have a burden, you know, like, isn't that part of like the body of Christ? Yeah. Right? Isn't it? Yeah. And I think if we, if we don't, um, give space for those things, even the unfinished, the unanswered whys in our lives. If we don't talk about those things and and we can speak in in faith about them, but if we don't talk about them at all, then Mm. there, that will compound the isolation. I was just going to say the isolation. When we've talked about like people who are victims of abuse or someone who's struggling through an addiction, any kind Mm -hmm. of addiction, 
one of the, the, the biggest things, gifts that you can give that person is to say like, you're not alone, Mm. you know, to say like, I believe you and this must be hard for you. Yeah. And there, there has to be uh, a space for that suffering to like, it, it does take up space and we can say like, you're not alone in this or, you know, me too. Right. Like CS Lewis talks about friendship is that moment of, me too. Like that's how you are. Me too. Mm -hmm. And there's a sense that you can breathe Mm -hmm. because somebody else has walked this path and they're standing before me and they're still breathing. Yes. And that's why I love even talking about people's scars, right? We want to hide our scars, but I think they're like, there's so much value in letting people see our scars because I'm not bleeding anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I'm healed. Yeah. That this is a scar but it used to be bleeding and infected and awful. And look at me now. Yeah, yeah it's there, but I'm still here and I'm still and, trusting in the Lord. And isn't that like what the tempter would want to silence the testimony of the wilderness, right? Like the healing of the wilderness, mm. right? Like the thorns. I was thinking of, um, so thinking about raging, which is the opposite of yielding, right? Yeah. Like let's rage uh, in this proverb, Proverbs 19 Three, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. One of the things that happens, maybe we would say our wilderness experience does come from a life of sin. Like a, like those who are born again and um, uh, live in a, a pattern of sin or a season of sin that is grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit, um, God within them. Um, there is a process of reaping what you sow. And many times God is trying to get our get attention yeah. and, and break through and a wilderness is brought into the picture. And one good example is in Hosea chapter two, when we look at Hosea and, um, and the picture of the woman in this chapter is, um, is Israel mm-hmm. in the context. The adulterous woman. But it is also right. a picture of every one of us. Yeah. And one thing I heard uh, recently from the uh, like a marriage retreat that we did last year was like, if you think it's you know your spouse, you you got another thing coming. <laughs> yeah, it's Point you. the finger at you, right? Like yeah. it's it starts with us, and it's really speaking to us in in, a, in another context. But it says in chapter two, God is speaking, and He goes, "I will hedge up her away with number one with thorns." And I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her path. This is God bringing thorns and walls to affect those he loves Mm. into a very difficult place. And it says, she shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them. She shall seek them, but she shall not find them. Then she shall say, (laughs) she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband Mm. for it was better for me than, than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain and wild uh, wine and oil who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for bail. Therefore I will take back my grain in its time and my wine in its seasons. And I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. God's like, it's my wilderness. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to teach a lesson. Yeah. I'm going to be a teacher. Because I love you. And it's all, when you read this whole chapter, it's love. (laughs) He's like literally giving the thorns and putting up the walls Mm -hmm. to, to things that happen in our life to get our attention, to go, you know, the grain and oil mm. and y- you know, the wool and the flax, yeah. that was me. Yeah. That wasn't, that wasn't your other lovers. Wow. That was your first lover. So, okay. So come back to so, me. Don't rage. What you're saying is we like, we, we, we're going to have situations and sometimes it's going to be like literally our own doing. Then God is going to say, because of your choices, I, I need to do this for you because mm. I love you. And there's going to be other times where it's not going to be because of your own choices. Another part we were thinking about was Joseph. Yeah. Joseph gets sold by his brothers, becomes a slave, 
wrongly accused. So then he was from slave to convict. Mm. And now he's sitting in rotting in an Egyptian prison far away from anybody who knows him at all. And all of this is God's doing. Yes. It's all God's doing. And it says throughout it that the Lord was with him. That's like your little snippet of like, there might be a happy ending here. Right. <laughs> Cause it's like, it's going real bad and it gets from like bad to worse. But we, we see throughout it like God was with him, God was with him. And then at the end, it becomes clear that not only was God with him, but he brought him all the way to Egypt, all the way to that prison so that he could interpret mm-hmm. that dream, so that he could be in charge, so that he could rescue the nation of Israel out of that famine. All of that was God's doing. Mm. And if he was sitting in that prison asking why... He wouldn't know. Yeah. All he knew was that God was with him. Mm. He trusted that God was with him, but he did not know why he was in that, in that prison cell, you know? So I think ultimately the conclusion is we don't always know why. Sometimes it's obvious like, okay, I made these choices. Here I am. And now it's, am I going to yield or am I going to rage against Mm. God? Like Jonah, Jonah knew why he was in that, in the belly of that whale. Now, what are you going to do? Mm. So sometimes there is a clear reason, but other times there isn't. Mm. Why am I in this situation? Well, and isn't it so much better to start our day like this way? Uh, we say that I've said that often, like maybe just pointing the finger at me instead of somewhere else, like starting, like, you know, examine me, Lord, second yeah. Corinthians, um, a 13, mm-hmm. I think it's verse nine. Like, Know me, uh, yeah. Psalm 139. See if there be any wicked way within me, right? Because, yeah, and, and I think also as we talk about this, it's evident that God's God wants to do something. Yes, that's what I was going to say. That, that's to me more bottom line than it's just God wants to else. do something, yeah. <laughs> and and we're it's whether or not we want to submit to that. And it says later in this chapter in Hosea chapter two. Like with Joseph, whether he's in a pit or a palace, Mm. right? Therefore, behold, I allure her and I bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her and where I give her a vineyard and make the Valley of Achor a door of hope. The Valley of Achor is in reference oh, door of hope. Uh, to um, Joshua, I believe it's Joshua chapter 10, in a very sad time when mm. God had to judge the nation of Israel because of its sin. It was trouble. It was sorrow. It was sadness. But God's like, I'm going to turn that around. Mm. You wait and see, and I'm going to make it a door of hope. And there shall the answer in those days, uh, and there shall be an answer as in the days of her youth at the time when she came up out of the land of Egypt, like there will be a song to sing. There will be a testimony to have and don't ever hold back these testimonies and songs, right? Because each wilderness experience only exalts Christ even more. And that's what a tempter wouldn't want us to do in the wilderness, right? The teacher's like, yes, exalt me more. Show, show the world about my grace, show the world I'm rich in mercy and abounding in loving kindness. Right. Like, but the tempter's kind of like trying to put a lid on it, trying to put a spin on it. And like, you know what I mean? Like make it, like it muddy and gray and, and, and like not really having any purpose. Yeah. And that really, really compounds the issue when, when, when the person, um, doesn't doesn't allow God to do the deep work. Yeah. And um, I was just thinking just maybe in closing that, that like, don't be afraid to ask the Lord, like what's going on. Mm. Um, we can do that. Uh, Luke nine forty five, um, John sixteen seven, And then also Mark five nineteen. when, when the, um, when the, uh, the young, boy that gets healed from his demon possession, he wants to go with Jesus, um, on the boat. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, no, Mm. (laughs) it's like a really like disappointing moment. But Jesus says, go home, Mm. like go home. And I've always thought that so profound, like he's been through such a tough season. God's healed him. And the Lord's like, you can't come with me. I want you to go home. 
And I think what it really signifies is that your wilderness is for a reason. Like God's got a plan for your wilderness Mm -hmm. to bring a door of hope. Yeah. And so he's like sending the the demon possessed boy. He's like, go home. Mm -hmm. Tell everyone about the mercy of God. That's what it says in Mark chapter five. Wow. You know, and it's like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go tell everyone about this wilderness and how God delivered me out of it. Right. So, and I would just, maybe because I'm taking over here, Liz. No, I'm just you're cool, good. I'm full loving on it. taking over. Let's just read this verse to close. Psalm 107. It says in verse uh, 33, 34, and 35, it's two versions of the same story. They're flipped around. He turns a river into a desert, springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste. Because of the evil of its inhabitants. That's one thing. Mm. Verse 35. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish the city to live in it. Like, do you see the reasoning? Like both happen. Yeah. You can't have one without the other. And God's in both. Right? Yeah. Isn't that really cool? Like, that's so good. We got to embrace this and yield to it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all we have for today. I hope this was encouraging to those who are listening. Thank you so much for joining us and and just keep tuning in as we go through this topic in different ways this week. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you watch or listen. And um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Yes. Have a great day, guys.